for uh, joining us here on the legal and policy track. Uh, for those of you who are here for the panel, where we finished was like, wow, if all of us who care deeply about these free software legal and policy issues only got a little bit better about talking to other people about it, how much we could get done. And then as if like I was psychic or something, I asked Ricky to talk about that exact topic to finish our day here. So let's give her a warm round of applause to finish our day. Thank you. All right, thank you, Deb, for inviting me to um, be part of this also. And um, I feel like I should give a disclaimer. My brother and sister-in-law are lawyers, and so um, in every message, you know, hey, Aunt Ricky, here's a disclaimer before you see these photos of your niece and nephew. But <laughs> I'm a, I am a layperson. I'm not a lawyer. Um, uh, but I work on opensource.com, which is a site supported by Red Hat. And we uh, get lots of proposals, it's a community site, so we get lots of proposals from people of all different areas of open source communities, um, people who uh, are, are lawyers and um, you know, experts in legal topics and copyright topics, and then um, community members uh, you know, writing about topics that interest them and personal experiences. And so part of my job, though, is to um, uh, you know, check for red flags when I'm reading through these and things that um, are unclear or wrong and can get us in trouble and get them in trouble or provide bad advice to readers. Um, and we also get lots of messages from people asking us what license they should choose and that sort of thing. And the only bit of legal advice I ever give anybody would be don't take legal advice from inexperienced and unprofessional you know, strangers online. <laughs> and so I write back and say, I can't give you that advice. That's a horrible thing for me to offer anybody is legal advice. So, um, but opensource.com, um, I'm going to use some examples and talk about our experience there because um, it's a nice little microcosm. I think it offers a, a snapshot of what's going on in open source communities because it is a community site and we do have such a range of people writing for us and it's, um, uh, we really work on having diversity in our topics and the people writing, so international topics also, inter international um, legal issues. So um, I, I wanted to use one example of, of an article that came through that I actually ended up, we, uh, I had to do quite a bit of, of editing on it, and then even after I fixed a lot of things that I knew were wrong in terminology, I also sent it to our uh, legal consultants on our site, some of my colleagues, and got their um, feedback on it. And I think the examples in this one article, we see these fairly regularly, and um, uh, terminology, using terminology incorrectly, because these... Um, Words um, people think are, have very similar meanings, but they don't. Um, and so, um, you know, somebody kept talking about whether stuff was copyrighted online and that cer certain things weren't copyrighted, and um, he was using it incorrectly. And so that's uh, a terminology that um, if you're speaking to a layperson and you're talking about copyright, you might need to add a sentence um, or two explaining, um, you know, what you mean by that and providing a little more context because there's still a lot of confusion about copyrights versus, um, you know, patents, and the difference between licensing, uh, freely or liberally licensed um, versus public domain. Um, you know, we, uh, if you're an expert and you cover these topics a lot, uh, you know what you mean, and you forget that um, these terms can be quite confusing for um, uh, regular members of the community. Um, for example, Creative Commons, um, that's one I think is uh, a common <laughs> a mistake that people make. Um, they talk about um, it's under the Creative Commons license, um, but that's not actually a license. Um, it's a, you know, a collection of um, licenses, and um, uh, the, uh, Creative Commons actually you know, has this nice little feature where you can pick which license is best for you, you know, based on how you want to uh, have your content shared. Um, it, uh, for example, if we're using creative content, uh, creative commons content on opensource.com art, we have to check and make sure um, it can be uh, adapted, you know, edited. You know, some people don't want their images modified and that sort of thing. So there are specific licenses within that collection. So here's an example of an article that was published on our site. Um, uh, Jane Park wrote um, about teaching kids about copyright, and she, it was a, an article that was um, basically summarizing a lot of good resources for readers. Um, and so you're pretty safe there if you're a layperson um, writing about legal issues if you're providing a list of where to get better legal uh, uh, information. And so here's a couple of interesting um, 
uh, examples from that. She, um, I picked an Australian example, um, and, uh, and then um, a, a link to an EFF article. And so I looked at both of those, and both of those articles are under um, Creative Commons licensing, and, um, but they're different, you know. Uh, so if, if you say it's under uh, the Creative Commons license, no, it's a license. Um, they picked a specific one under the EFF site and then um, um, on the smart copying site. And then again, in both cases, you know, or in many cases, they'll say everything is under this license unless it says otherwise. And that's generally how we publish things on our site also. It's under a Creative Commons license unless somebody um, has shared their content under a, a different one. Um, and uh, it, this was uh, another uh, interesting article that we had recently. Um, uh, Scott Peterson, who's a member of the Red Hat legal team, um, wrote about all the different kinds of licenses, open source licenses. That's another huge area of confusion. Um, and there are so many licenses, and, and then um, I, I, think we're, I think we're seeing less of a trend of people creating new licenses because it's just crazy to have all those licenses. But I like the angle of this story. He was talking about how licenses are a shared resource. Um, and so uh, you, you might think that your situation is very unique and different and needs a special license, but um, uh, I, I recommend reading the article because he was talking about um, your situation isn't probably so unique. There's probably already a license out there and you don't want such a specific license that, you've, um, that it won't hold up in court or whatever because you know, part of uh, having a license that's already been out there for a while and is on other projects um, there are already cases, you know, that are example cases, and um, so you don't want to uh, have a bunch of crazy licenses that you create. Um, and I'll show you some examples here shortly. Um, and these, uh, open source, um, dot org, not to be confused with open source dot com, as but it will be <laughs> open source initiative. Um, there's there's where you want to go if you want to look at um, what's available uh, for open source licenses, and these are what they have listed as the most popular, most common licenses. Um, and so if you um, are talking to somebody about the Apache license or whatever, if you're ever talking to a layperson about it, you're going to need to go ahead and, um, and add a sentence or two about what that is, you know, um, and describe it. Um, uh, particularly if it is a key part of your discussion, you know, you're going to want to say um, what it means, how is it different than other licenses, or, or they picked this license because it allows them to do this, this, and this, or they didn't go with this license but, um, that um, people recommended because that license wouldn't allow them to do this. So you have to provide that bit of context because um, all these licenses are very confusing for um, uh, regular folks, whereas um, uh, people who deal with it all the time forget that we get all these confused. <laughs> you know, if, you, if you're always talking, if you're in, uh, dealing with Apache license all the time, you forget that uh, I, I don't have that one memorized, and so you're going to have to explain a couple things to me when you talk to me about it. So um, here's a, another uh, uh, common, I, I put this uh, tweet out and asked uh, the community uh, sometime last week what were things that confused them, um, and um, being too US-centric or um, whatever country you're from. Yesterday I saw Kate um, talking uh, in the uh, WootConf track, um, seeing the big picture using open source images, and she's a photographer, and um, so she immediately said, I'm not a lawyer, I'm sharing my personal experience, so she, was, she made it clear she wasn't providing legal advice. Um, but she also made it clear that she was talking about her experience with Australian law, which is different from uh, other countries, and that's something that we have to be very aware of on opensource.com because we are, um, we, you know, we're trying to make sure we have a nice international community and we cover international topics, but we are located in the U.S. and many people who write for us are, are, are also, and we have to um, make sure that when we're talking about um, legal topics that we're mindful that what is legal or standard in one country is not in, in other countries. Like fair use, I guess, is very different in Australia than it is in the US, that was one example she talked about. Um, and then uh, uh, another co common problem, like I said, is confusing all the large number of licenses. So I showed you some of the most popular ones that um, OSI has. And so I, was, I couldn't put these all on one slide, so let me show you. Um, they have them in alphabetical order, or you can look under categories. And so these are um, the ones they have approved. <laughs> 
So don't go, you, don't, might, you might not need to create a new license. They probably have what you need. <laughs> um, all right, and so now uh, let's talk about some of the hot topics um, that we have on our site. Um, some of you might know Richard Fontana. I believe he's spoken here today. <laughs> uh, and so he wrote an article for us at the end of the year. I asked him to um, pick up uh, some of the um, uh, hot topics um, in, uh, in 2016. And um, so I found a theme. I, I put the shortened link up there for the article. We just published it, I think, in December. Um, and I don't think there's a lot of change in these themes dramatically year to year. You know, fair use, compliance, copyright infringement, um, uh, licensing, what's going on with specific licenses. And then um, a really hot topic that I think will continue to be a hot topic and maybe even increase is government open source policy. Um, a, a lot of these other topics, no offense uh, are, but to lawyers in the room or whatever, are pretty boring for lay people. <laughs> and so they, you know, a short news piece is interesting, but a longer article about a, the, a court case and all the details people are less interested in. Um, they seem to be very interested in um, what this means for their government, what this means, you know, for um, their schools or for their cities. You know, how my, how's my tax dollars? How are they being wasted or, you know, saved or whatever? Um, and so the uh, government open source policy in the U.S. this year was um, particularly interesting because they um, announced um, an open source policy, and then it was. Um, we haven't seen dramatic results yet. I think we're still in that process. We don't know what that is going to mean for us yet, but it was exciting to hear that we're moving in that direction. Now, Paul Brown, um, is a, he's a former colleague of mine um, from Linux New Media. He um, is a, a tech writer and editor, um, and he's based out of Spain. And uh, I think he, he, was, uh, he does work with uh, Free Software Foundation Europe. And so he wrote, um, to make sure we get that international coverage, uh, another article for me recently, five initiatives that push the free software envelope in Europe. And the really hot topics that he's, he's seeing internationally is um, government open source um, uh, and standards policies. And so um, I provided some examples just from his article and he had um, and there were more, but these were just three, and so uh, that's, um, I think, uh, I don't know, it's, it's, it's exciting that other countries are also looking at this, and um, uh, we'll see what happens this year. Um, and then uh, David Perry um, just wrote, uh, he looked at our most popular legal articles from the past year and collected them, and one that he included that, um, weren't included in those other two were patents and patent trolls. And then he, he predicted that um, uh, patent reform will be a hot topic in 2017. So we'll see how that goes. So um, I said I would talk about who's covering these topics. Don't be surprised, but lawyers. Um, <laughs> most of our um, articles are written um, by uh, you know, uh, lawyers or um, some kind of legal experts for different organizations and foundations. Um, nonprofits, um, but uh, tech writers and members of the community can also write articles that um, are very helpful for other community members um, and for projects. Um, ben Cotton is one of our, um, uh, he's an example that uh, has written several articles for us um, on these topics in the past year, and he's one of our moderators and writers. He's a meteorologist by training and a CISA admin um, specializing in uh, high performance computing. And um, a really interesting um, way for pe regular folks to write about or talk about these topics is um, talking about um, what's going on in their own communities with open source uh, law topics. He wrote this um, New York tax bill would provide a tax credit for open source contributors. It was hugely popular on the site. People were very interested, not just New Yorkers. You know, that was interesting to all of us, you know. And um, he also wrote a really good um, resource page for us, What is Copy Left? just having that kind of basic explanation. And again, he didn't invent the definition. He rounded up and kind of summarized it and then um, provided a nice list of resources for our readers to be able to go find out more. Um, and then he also did an opinion piece um, based on uh, a, a case, the case for educating judges on open source licensing. Um, and then uh, there are 50 billion D um, and more online resources. These are a few that I, I recommend um, and people from these organizations um, write for us and, um, and uh, uh, for learning more about um, legal topics in open source, open source initiative obviously, and then um, Free Software Law Center and uh, Software Freedom Conservancy, woohoo, and um, Electronic Frontier Foundation. <laughs> 
Um, but there are plenty more. And that was that I had one more, but I guess that was that was it. And then I have a few minutes for questions. I thought I'd have this down to three minutes because I just had my fourth cup of coffee, but so. <laughs> All right, um, do anybody have any um, questions? Not legal advice related questions, but. Do you uh, have conversations with people about how to walk that line between providing legal advice and just providing kind of opinion or backgrounds? Um, well, we do not provide the legal advice on our site, and um, so I wouldn't advise anybody on how to provide legal advice. I no, would no, tell no, them. I oh yeah, then I, I tell them you don't want to be providing legal advice. You can um, uh, definitely recommend great sources where people can find out more. You know. Um, and I'm always happy to do that with people, or I can say we might have some articles that can point you in the right direction, or um, uh, people who are asking us about which license, I always send them over to OSI, start there, you know, and uh, they will help you get started with licensing. Um, and then people who are talking about setting up their businesses, um, I say you need to meet with a lawyer, you need to talk to a lawyer, don't just, you know, go off willy-nilly and just pick something online from a random stranger. Um, you know, you should get some professional help, that's going to be money well spent, so. Any more questions for Ricky? So I was just taking a moment to work out how to phrase this. Um, you mentioned about being careful about the content you're curating given your responsibilities under law. Um, given what you're producing, how do you balance that with the fact in this internet age, the content you are producing is consumed globally, many different countries, many different jurisdictions. Perhaps this is something that's covered in other parts of this mini-conf today, but how do we be both compliant and ethical in our country and in other countries? How do you approach it? Not how do we do it, but how are you currently approaching to be compliant and ethical in your country, but in other countries that are reading your content what steps should we be taking? Um, for content on our site or for um, specific well, projects? Well, in ge well, let's start with content. What's your approach around content? Because the same thing is true around projects. You know, we face different um, potential legal ramifications or warranty ramifications. Or, um, you know, there, there's always the risk that an in-country law that we will have an impact on the open source license that, or, that, that we're trying to maintain. Yeah, I, well, I think they're two really dramatically different topics because for a site like us, um, we're not providing legal advice, we're just providing information. Um, and uh, generally, we're not providing, um, a, a, unless it's written you know, by a lawyer who is letting us know about a specific case, we're not providing original content. We are um, framing news yeah. or court case information to deliver. So, so classic ones like things like imagery, uh, many countries have fair use provisions versus mm -hmm. you'll try and use content that's creative commons or under a specific construct, therefore you're not worried about fair use provisions being different in different countries, whereas often that's ignored online or... Um, Again, I think that it helps if um, you talk about, um, if you specify which law you're talking about and um, what country that applies to. Um, and then um, if it's under a specific license, um, I mean, you could say what it's licensed under, and then you can't go and tell everybody they're, what they're allowed to do in their country. That's on the reader to figure out. So. A real simple example is New Zealand has no fair use provision mm -hmm. for, for reuse of content. So, for example, if you make a presentation at LinuxConf for you in Australia and you're using a copyrighted image or a piece of audio or, 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 or video, there are certain fair use provisions under Australian law. No. You don't have fair use either? Yeah. I think this one might have to wait for the bar. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs>
I haven't been to New Zealand, so I can't help you. Time for one more question or not? Yeah, I'm yeah. fine. I got nothing else going on. <laughs> You're done? Okay. Any other questions? All right, I've got one for you, Ricky. Um, first, uh, sort of a thank you sneak in there. I think opensource.com is awesome. Thank you. Um, you sort of touched on getting some of your team to look at what was popular last year and that, you know, a couple of topics kind of rose up amongst that. Um, how, what do you... You know, on balance compared with all of the content that on opensource.com, how much is this legal policy, patents, copyright area sort of compare with other types of content? It's less cool. Um, yeah. It's like it's less popular in, in general. However, um, that the New York um, tax credit article um, was hugely popular. Um, and that was one that uh, we thought it was a good, interesting article. And we don't base the success of an article on whether or not it's popular. You know, I mean, we, uh, it's one way you can gauge one thing, which is popularity. Um, we still want to provide um, content that's interesting and useful, and that might just be for a niche group or whatever. And so we thought it was an interesting article. Um, we were really surprised at how um, well it did with readers. Um, and we, you know, discussed it in meetings, like, why? What was this? You know, because it's fascinating to us, you know. Um, so that one was as popular as, you know, articles on Raspberry Pi or whatever, so I couldn't tell you why, but... <laughs> it, it was a winner. <laughs> um, any other questions? Yeah? No? Well, um, please put your hands together for an awesome thank you to Ricky. Great thank talk. You.